you both deserve a long introduction. Um, but I'll start with Dana. And I first met you when you were singing with Dream Freedom Revival, and which was a funky group of people who were traveling through space and time, trying to create democracy wherever they went. And, uh, and then I, I think that's when we got to know each other. And then Dana came and um, directed, was a director with the choir for three years and um, soloist. She's also, um, she's sung with the Syracuse Symphony and she's been a teacher. She's been teaching at Hamilton, the leading the choir there. I went to one of the concerts, it was phenomenal. And also at, um, let's see, where else are you? Well, Oswego, you sung with the Syracuse Opera, Symphoria, Oswego, the Society for New Music. You've been teaching at Lemoyne um, and you traveled with a ska band once and <laughs> uh, you have a variety of amazing vocal accomplishments um, and, uh, and also an incredible, um, this opera singer in my mind, I mean, you know. And Gregory, I met you actually, uh, Marsha's mom introduced us, which was the first time or I met you and, um, um, but I'd known about you and Karen Franklin was sitting next to me and I was, that's Gregory Shepard. We gotta get, we gotta get him here. Or we, got, we gotta work with him or something. So um, I'm so glad to know more about you. You've been, um, you actually, Marsha was one of your choir directors at Tucker Missionary. And you, yeah, you grew up here. Tucker was your church, um, which is an amazing, just an amazing story of uh, the beauty of voice everywhere. Uh, and you had a huge career. You, you said you've been in the city for 30 years, I think, um, earlier. And uh, you sung with the New York City Opera, uh, Lake George Opera, Metropolitan Opera, Education, Glimmer Glass. There's tons of stuff, including the Syracuse Symphony, symphonies all over the United States in Denver and St. Louis. Um, you've been in Europe. You've gotten awards in Europe. Um, you including, and you've gotten awards here from the Metropolitan Opera National Council Awards, Study Grant and um, Opera Artists of the Year. And I know you've done a lot of work around um, promoting and thinking about African-American opera singers. Uh, I think you told me that in a project in New York City, which is great. So, I mean, there's lots more to you. And I've, I've really enjoyed um, laughing a lot with you this year on the phone and other times. So you have a great sense of humor also. So welcome. Dana and Gregory are also good friends and have sung together on a, on a number of occasions. So we're, we're so happy to, to have you here and um, welcome. I'll hand it, hand it over to you. Good evening. Thank you, Thank you Karen. And thank you, Allison, for having us um, tonight. Um, this is weird. I have only my my face. Okay, there's okay. there's Gregory's no, too. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Um, so tonight, Gregory and I are very excited to be here. Um, a lot of you already know me. I've worked with a lot of you, but some of you don't. So Gregory and I will um, do some some longer introductions and talk about our background in a minute. But um, at this point, uh, we're going to start with Gregory. Gregory, if you would like to introduce yourself, uh, give us a little history of how you um, came into the opera world, where you're from, how you got there, and then if you would sing your first piece for us, that would be awesome. And uh, and then we'll go on from there. Sure. Hello, everyone. Thanks again for the invitation, for having me here this evening, along with Danan. Uh, I was born in St. Petersburg, Florida, but we moved to Syracuse when I was three and a half years old. And I grew up in Syracuse on the south side in Central Village, which is what it was called then. Now it's called Brick City. Uh, and right down the street from where I grew up was the historic Tucker Baptist Church. And that's where I met Marsha Andrews Hagen when I was seven years old. And I had the good fortune of being in the junior choir and Marsha and her sister Ava were the choir directors. 
And um, that's really where I started singing. And I, I mean, I know that's where I started singing in Tucker Baptist Church at seven years old in junior choir with Marsha. Um, and I, 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 I always knew, yeah, yeah, I, you know, huge, huge kudos and accolades to Marsha because as, as a, a, a young kid growing up, she and her sister and Sherman Cummings and LeGreer Cummings and all of those teenagers were like my idols. I wanted to sing like that, sing gospel like that, be a part of Soul Generation, all of these things that these um, young teens were doing. I thought like, this is fantastic. That's what I want to do. Um, and so my, my, my indoctrination into music and singing really comes from the Baptist church, as is the story with many singers, you know, not the Baptist church, but beginning to sing in church. So that's where I started, um, growing up in church singing, uh, eventually studying piano and then playing piano in church. And, you know, when I was probably 10 or 11 years old, Marsha and Ava left Syracuse. They left and moved to New York. Uh, and when she came back, I was a teenager and she formed the young adult choir at Tucker and I was in that as well. So I did a lot of singing under Marsha uh, in my growing up uh, years. I went to Henninger High School, studied with Mary Gaucher, who was the music teacher there and went on to Syracuse University as a voice major. But my intention was not to sing opera. I didn't know anything about opera. I knew uh, who Marian Anderson was. I knew who Leontine Price was. But it was the teacher that I had in college that encouraged me to change my major. I actually went in as a music education major. I wanted to be a high school music teacher, a uh, direct high school choir. And again, Marsha had introduced me in 1976 to Andre Crouch. So I wanted to have like a gospel group like Andre Crouch and travel all over the world singing, you know, gospel and being a school teacher. Um, but my teacher, Patty Thompson, uh, she saw things differently. Uh, she was having a, a wonderful career all around the country and in Europe. And she said to me, you know, I, I really think that you should consider a degree in performance. Uh, she took me to the opera. The first opera I saw was Don Giovanni. And it really made such an impact on me that it really, really changed my whole thinking. And it was there when I was 17 years old in Syracuse at the Civic Center that I decided that I wanted to be an opera singer. And the piece that I'm going to sing this evening is one of the very first pieces that Patty Thompson taught me. It's called Vecchia Simara, and it's from the opera La Boheme. It takes place in the last act of the opera. The character Colline, Vecchia Simara, is old coat. It's sort of a, a big overcoat that has no shape or form to it. And he sings uh, to this coat, uh, thank you for all of our time together. Uh, I'm going to pass you on and uh, I'm going to stay here, but you have been so wonderful to me all of these years. And for this, I thank you and I say goodbye. And he's singing this aria actually while Mimi is in the same room and she is there dying. And every time I sing this piece, I always think um, not so much about the coat, but about saying farewell to my friend. Uh, and so I'll sing it for you now. It's Vecchia Simara from the last act of Puccini's La Boheme. Oh, you're going to have to give me a couple seconds to get the technical stuff straight here. All right, so audio settings. Automatically adjust comes off, right, Danan? This moves over. Okay. Now this goes here. Position okay? A little more towards the piano. Better. Better. Okay, give it a try. Right. No, the other way, no, more, more the other way. Back towards the piano. No? Oh, it's right there. Okay, we'll try that. Tomorrow, 
Vorschläge will so drum und That's it. Um, that was okay. wonderful, Gregory. Thank you, Dana. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so now we're going to hear from Dana, and uh, she'll give us a little of her story. And then I'm going to ask her some questions about what she's doing and what she's doing and what she's doing. <laughs> Wonderful. And before I talk about myself, um, I just want to tell you that when I first moved to Syracuse, which was about 13 years ago, um, I got involved with the Syracuse Opera Chorus and I kept hearing about this person that everybody just absolutely loved that was from Syracuse, but was an international operatic star. And he came back to Syracuse all the time to sing with Syracuse Opera named Gregory Shepard. And um, so to me, Gregory was this like elusive superstar that I would never be friends with or have a relationship with or, you know, um, you know, meet. Or if I met him, I would just be like, oh, it's Gregory. And that's exactly what happened the first time I met him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I heard about Gregory for, for years before we actually met. And then, um, and we've, we've met at, we, I can't remember the first time we met Gregory. When was that? Was that for the. Carmen, right? No, no. For no. the Civic Morning Musical's 125th anniversary. Yes. So, um, back when we were both in college at separate times, Gregory and I had been in this competition here in Syracuse. Cause I went to Eastman and he went to SU and, um, uh, with Neva Pilgrim, who is a, 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 you know, music mainstay in Syracuse. Um, and he, oh, Gregory, did you win? You won first place, didn't you? Yes. Yes. But it was yeah, like 20 yeah. years before you won. It was like a well, long, so long when I, <laughs> when I was in the competition, I won second place two years in a row. Um, <laughs> So I wasn't as cool as Gregory, but, um, but so they had this 125th anniversary concert and they wanted to bring back former winners. And so of course we were local and they brought us back. And that's, that's when Gregory and I uh, first right. met and sang together um, in a trio from uh, Così Fan Tutte. Così Fan Tutte. Yep. Uh, yeah, and it was just wonderful. That's right. That's right. That was the other one that we did together. That was just so wonderful. So, uh, I so Gregory. For, I interrupt for a second. Gregory, could you change your sound back to the way it was before for speaking? This is, now I have it on the original. Turn it back to how I sang. No, we, you're very low at this point by comparison. So to put the auto on maybe. It's on. Interesting. Okay. Is All right. Maybe better? I'll just talk quieter. <laughs> Is this better, Steve? Uh, not really. No, I don't know. I, I put it back to the original setting before. Can you raise I up the, sang. just drag it, slide it to the right more. I did. That's Is that better. better? Yes. Okay. All right, cool. All right. Excellent. 
Great. So, so Gregory was um, a superstar in my mind, and I was very intimidated to meet him. Come to find out, he is, you know, one of the nicest people that I've ever met, and we have subsequently been in a number of shows together with the Society for New Music, and are currently working on the opera uh, about a uh, Syracuse person named Libba Cotton. Libba. Yep. And um, and we're also doing something together in December, which we'll talk about at the end. That yes. uh, is a project of Gregory Shepherd's for Syracuse Opera. So, um, so I all right. I'm gonna stop fangirling about Gregory. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just give you a little bit of background about myself. I know a lot of you know me um, because I worked with the community choir for three years, and uh, that was such a wonderful time in my life. You know, uh, Karen and I became quite close. Uh, I had. I still have three relatively young kids. They were much younger when Karen and I were collaborating a lot. Um, I do have a teenager now, so that's crazy. Uh, but so my husband and I moved here 13 years ago from New York City. I was in the city to um, to you know pursue my dream of musical theater and performing and rock and roll. And so that is what I did when I was there. I, I was in lots of shows. I was never I was never on Broadway. I did some off Broadway stuff, but um you know that that's a that's a different that's a different uh level of performing that I have not done yet or probably ever will. Um and I but I also was the lead singer for a corporate party band. <laughs> So I sang lots of Shania Twain and um, uh, Aretha and, you know, what did I sing? My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion. You know, stuff like that. Party songs. Mm. Yeah. Um, it was really, really fun. And they took me all over the world. I, I traveled to, to Thailand. It was one of my most famous, my one of my most memorable um, gigs that I did was in Thailand. Um, so, so my... Um, my foray into opera was different and similar to Gregory's. I grew up in Pennsylvania, in central Pennsylvania, and my first singing was done in my church as well. We were, I was brought up in the Methodist church. I sang with my youth choir, and then I sang with my teen choir, and then I sang with the adult choir. Um, and I, I just loved the music. I loved the music in church. I loved the music in high school. I did not want to be a music teacher. I did want to be a performer, but I, I never really thought about opera when I was a kid because I wasn't exposed to it. My parents listened to the Beach Boys and, um, you know, pop music of the of the time. Um, I listened to a lot of Barry Manilow when I was growing up with my mom. We used to sing Barry Manilow in the car together. Um, so I was not exposed to opera until I went to college and started, you know, studying with a with a teacher, a classical teacher there at, at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, which was a wonderful program. Um, and she exposed me to a lot of opera there. My very first opera role was as um, the young boy, Carabino, in um, The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart. Uh, and that was uh, just a really wonderful role for me. It's, it's called a pants role. So I played a boy, but a prepubescent boy. So I, you know, he had a, a high voice like I had or like I have. Um, and it was just it was just interesting learning about opera through through my college experience and then going to Dallas Opera because they had free tickets for us. And so that was kind of how I um, how I found out about opera and how I was exposed to it and then was in the operas. Um, I, even after college, I wasn't sure I wanted to be an opera singer, but I en ended up going to grad school at Eastman. Um, I studied classical music and opera there as well. But then, um, when I got out, I actually joined the military and I was, I was a professional choir member, um, in the alto section for the military for about five years. And I started singing pop music. So as Karen said, I was the lead singer for a ska band. Um, which is like a punk band and add horns and like kind of a, I don't know, I guess that's the best way for me to describe ska. Um, and we traveled all up and down the East Coast doing music like that. And so uh, not only, so I was trained classically, I was trained in like a legit technique, but then most of my career was in pop music and I, and I mostly was like what they call a belter or, um, you know, a pop singer. So but I feel like, but I know for sure that my uh, grounding and my foundation in classical music and in legit technique 
is the only reason why I was able to, for so many years and still am, sing pop music in a healthy way. So um, <clears throat> one of the roles that I have, uh, I've been in this opera, but never as this character, um, is Carmen. So uh, Gregory and I were actually in Carmen together at Syracuse uh, Opera in the last, what was it, five years ago? 2017. Four? 2017 okay um yeah and it was a wonderful production um that was full of drama on stage and off <laughs> and uh and it was a lot of fun to to watch uh this show come to life so a lot of you know the 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 uh, opera carmen because it's used a lot of the the arias are used in italian food commercials and you know uh movies often so um so now i'd like to sing one of carmen's arias from uh, from the opera. It's called the uh, Segedia. It is, um, so at this point, Carmen is actually in jail for fighting, and she is seducing her uh, captor to try to let her go to a party, and she's inviting him, of course, to go with her. Um, and this is, you know, this I feel like is one of the one of the ways that opera is definitely absolutely for the people. The character of of Carmen is a is a gypsy. Um, she's certainly living on the fringes of society, not in you know not a nobility. And uh, so let me uh, make my adjustments here to my sound, and then I will get going to sing for you as well. Do that. I think that's what I need to do there. And then. And then I don't play piano as well as Gregory does, so I'm using a track here at my house. Um, and I'm going to start it and then get in place. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. And you know what's funny is that um, the competition that uh, that Gregory and I sang for the 125th anniversary of, I actually mm -hmm. sang that song in the competition as a college. To student. win. So, that's that's your winning number. That was one. That was one of my winning numbers. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Danny, I just had a, wanted to ask you some things and just talk to you a little bit about your your singing and your career and what you do and, and how you came to do all of this. I, 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 Southern University, Eastman School of Music, New York City, the Army, mm -hmm. right? Yes. 
I mean, singing all of these different genres of music from classical to rock to Broadway belting, were you ever, I, I heard you speak earlier about, you know, your, your solid classically trained technique, but were you ever concerned about flip-flopping and singing in all these genres? I mean, I, I actually think it's a good thing if an artist can be that flexible, you know, um, because it, just because of the way the industry is not 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 all of the time will you be able to be working in the field of opera and if you can sing musical theater you should sing musical theater um i i just don't know many people that also sing jazz well renee fleming does right she sings right. jazz and opera and pop all right mm -hmm. so what what was that like for you what is that like for you in terms of how you keep your voice healthy singing all of those different things um well, thank you for asking, Gregory. Um, I, um, I, as I said before, I know that the fact that I have good technique with my breathing, the fact that I am, I have, you know, excellent posture, um, and um, have have a good connection to my body when I'm singing is the is the foundation on which I use all for for all of my techniques, and you know, relaxed jaw, relaxed tongue, you know, very good diction. Um, and I, I did have some concerns initially when I was first starting to sing pop music because I, I would get very tired um, and sometimes a little hoarse. So I had to figure out how to do it. Um, and I didn't have a teacher teaching me how to sing pop music or belt in musical theater stuff. So, so mm. I really had to um, figure it out on my own. And I, I was able to figure it out on my own in that I just started kind of doing it a little by little. And then as I built up my stamina in the, for the pop music, I could do a little bit more each time and then a little bit more. I mean, just like in singing opera after the pandemic and after, you know, a year of not really singing very seriously, um, I, I had to do that same thing with my, with my classical technique as well. So mm -hmm. I, I am reluctant often to go back and forth on the same program. Mm -hmm. um, and I have found I have found that my initial instinct was that I would need to sing classical first and then do the pop. And what I have figured out is that it's actually easier for me to sing the pop first if oh, I'm really? singing that on the same program and then the classical, which I thought was very strange. Um, mm -hmm. But I, but it is like, it's like a different larynx placement. It's a different, um, you know, I, I, I use my body differently, obviously for, for whatever I'm doing, but, um, but I, I have not found that, uh, my classical voice has suffered because I sing pop music and I've not found that my pop music has suffered because of my classical technique uh -huh. either. Yeah. Well, um, you, you sing beautifully, in it, so congratulations <laughs> on all that stuff. We talk about this. This opera is for the people. Um, I was involved at the Metropolitan Opera in a program called Opera is for Everyone, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I have always believed that long before uh, these events that have started transpiring over the last, you know, year or so, um, with the the various new works that are being presented, Terence Blanchard's. Uh, fire shut up in my bones at the Metropolitan Opera, or Libba here this day with Society for New Music. Um, the piece that uh, Denise Graves premiered this summer at Glimmerglass, uh, the Dawson piece uh, based on the Opera House that's in Pittsburgh, uh, and that the woman who founded that uh, Opera House, uh, or what Syracuse Opera is doing this this winter, um, the Ballad of the Brown King, which is a, a choral work written by Margaret Bonds, a, a Harlem Renaissance composer, and the text by Langston Hughes. Um, so, I mean, I think it's really interesting and uh, wonderful that all of these companies are getting on board and doing these various works. And that's why I think the programming uh, and operas for the people, Karen, we talked about this uh, down at Tucker Baptist Church, you know? Um, I, I did a recital, I think I told you this, Dana, and last spring, for Lincoln Center, and it was for all of the institutions at Lincoln Center, and it was actually, I told Karen this the other night, it was actually on Zoom. So, uh, because it was right in the middle of the pandemic, but they wanted to talk to me about uh, diversity in casting, diversity in programming. Um, and so I did a 30 minute recital, and then there was a conversation question and answer. 
And one of the things that they found uh, really interesting and what really impressed them was that Syracuse Opera is going to the people, that we are taking opera to the people. And that was one of the things that I stressed in the board meeting, that we have to go into the community. I was talking about the richness of the South Side community in terms of you know, culture and the music. And I said, and all of that comes out of the Black church. I said, so we take these programs to the South Side and engage the people within the community, make them free, you know, to expose people and get them involved in this experience. And what happened on Juneteenth, and Marsha was a part of this performance, when we presented uh, No Cowards in Our Band on the life of Frederick Douglass, Frederick's story is compelling, uh, an amazing story, but it was the singing. And I've talked to many people who have never heard that kind of singing, and it was the voice. Yes. And that's this thing that opera is for the people. It really is about the voice, that human instrument and how it connects to other human beings. And I know that you, you I mean, I don't wanna say it, but I know you feel the same way. And we've done a lot of outreach programming and into schools and stuff. So to, let, let's talk a little bit about that part of what we do of bringing opera to the people. Well, I, I think, um, you know, I loved No Cowards in Our Band. I just thought it was absolutely wonderful. But it, it dawns on me that opera is one of the only, it might be the only time that singers sing unmiked. So it's not, you know, of course, through Zoom, everything has to be miked. But in, in a live performance, you know, even at the Met or at the Civic Center, there are no microphones picking up the voice. So it's really just, it's just the person with the, the the classical technique and and it's it's loud enough and it's it's um it's it, the 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 fo the formants are, are are vibrating in a way that that it cuts through everything and it goes really really far and i think i think that's really wonderful i think that's one of the reasons why opera is for the people um uh, because there, there, there doesn't need to be a lot of uh, electronics. I mean, it's been around obviously before electronics were were even invented. So, so I love that. I love that idea. It also opera tells you know stories of the people. You know, just like right. I was talking about with Carmen. She, she's not nobility. They, they did a lot of a, a lot of Shakespeare works are set to opera. And then of course in in this day and age. Um, a lot of uh, very compelling stories are being set to opera, even though the Libba Cotton opera was is more of like a jazz or a, a musical theatery type uh, show. It is it is an opera and it, you know, it's sung all the way through and, um, you know, there's an orchestra and, it, you know, it's just a wonderful it's a it's a wonderful like it, um, melding of of styles to tell a really compelling story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So actually, um, Gregory, I had I had a question for you. Is it okay if I ask you a question now? Sure. Okay. Good. So, yeah. based on the fact that you grew up on the South Side, um, how did your family and friends react when you started talking about how you were going to be an opera singer? No. <laughs> um, there, there really was no. Uh, uh, reaction other than okay hmm. uh in terms of like with 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 my family um because i was at syracuse university and i was studying i was studying music so i had studied piano since i was eight so i was already in this kind of classical track so they knew that and my voice is what it is i mean it, it, you know even when i was 19 it, i didn't sound like a pop singer or blues singer the voice is just is you know like what it is so that that wasn't really anything unusual at home. It wasn't unusual at church because I sang in church all the time, and you know, you know, I'd sing hymns and stuff like that. And my voice, again, is what it is. Um, I think that the, it was with my friends that that found it uh, most interesting. They're like, "You're gonna do what?" <laughs> I said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing opera." They're like, you're like, Aah! so they would make those kinds of jokes and make fun of it, but. Um, very, very quickly uh, came around. I mean, it, 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 I, don't, I don't recall anything odd about it. I, I guess the odd thing is that, you know, we lived in the housing project and we had a piano. I mean, that, 
That was that people found that odder, you know, that I was studying piano. But, but I know Marsha and Ava had a piano too, because I used to go over to their house. They had a piano too. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't remember, I don't recall anything uh, strange about it. Uh, and then after Marsha and Ava left and moved to New York, you know, those responsibilities that they had at Tucker, I then became the director of the young adult choir. So I was like working in music at the church and singing the way I sang. And yeah, you know, it was all, it was always, no, 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 no issue at all. None. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. great. And uh, you know, we, you and I have talked a little bit about how I sing with kind of two different techniques. Does that happen with you at all? Do you, do you change your technique at all to accommodate a different style of music? Or, I mean, is that something that men do in general or talk a little bit? Yeah, about I, 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 I think, I think they do. Um, I, I sing, if, if I sing, if I'm singing any musical theater, it really is always um, the old fashioned American musical theater, you know, Showboat, Man of La Mancha, um, right. South Pacific. And I think that's because that's just the kind of voice that I, that I have. Um, you know, I, I can sing high, but my voice doesn't really lend itself to things like Rent or the last five years, the more contemporary musical theater. Um, so I don't sing that kind of stuff, but yeah, I, I make the adjustments. I mean, when I sing in church and I have to do, so, I mean, I, I can do that when, when, when it's called for. Yeah, absolutely. I've never heard you do that before. That's oh, really yes, cool. I do it, <laughs> but, but with, with microphone on a microphone. Right. Of course. On a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Cause absolutely. you can't project the same way. Right. Absolutely technique. not. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, talking uh, again more about opera is for the people. I was saying earlier on that, you know, uh, the, what's been going on the last year with these new works and all of this and, you know, taking these, these pieces to various communities and all. One of the things that I have always done, because I always understood it was important from the very early days of my career, the minute I arrive in a new town, the very first thing I do is find the black community, I find the black barbershop, and I find the black church. I go to a black restaurant and I start talking about music. I say, what what church is, where, where's the Baptist church in town? You know, I go to the barbershop, in the barbershop, we have a conversation about everything, figure out what everybody's doing, where everyone's from, and then I go to the black church and I begin talking about opera and the the not 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 so much about me, but about engaging people in the art form because I want I, I want it to be a more open and inclusive art form you know so for so for 20 years long before anything's been going on I've always been engaged in in outreach and community with opera because I wanted to not because anybody asked me to do it but because I want to see an audience that's diverse that there are people from all backgrounds that can enjoy this opera. I mean look they, they're, they're there are operas by African Americans. There are operas by Latino people. There are operas by um, Asian people. I mean, there are a lot. There's 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 so much work that could be done, and I'm really happy that Syracuse Opera is in favor of this idea of community outreach and engagement and including everyone. So the the piece that you're gonna I, I don't know if you, Dana may not have had a chance to look at it yet because I just gave her the music a, a couple of days ago. Uh, but it's the Ballad of the Brown King. Um, she actually only has one small duet in the piece, but but she'll be featured in the concert if you're able to uh, get there. The piece is, it's, it's a beautiful choral piece. Um, and the Brown King is the Balthazar of the Magi. Uh, so it's really a story about him. Uh, and it's really a major a choral piece to feature uh, the Syracuse Opera Chorus. And my idea is that this will feature the Syracuse Opera Chorus and how we get all the people involved, how we get community involved, is that we get members from the choir at Tucker and from Bethany and this great organization, those of you who might be interested in singing with Syracuse Opera on that evening and People's Amy Zion. And I guess some of my kids coming from John Jay College in New York City. Again, it's really about bringing people together and what can do that better than music. 
I agree. Well, and as you were talking about that, I just, I just love your approach to any new community that you, that you enter. I just, I just think that's so wonderful. And it, it, it just, it doesn't surprise me at all about you. You're such a bubbly and like outgoing personality. You make friends everywhere you go. I think it's just wonderful. Um, but I also wanted to mention that when I was in the military, uh, we, we were, we were required to be in these small groups and we did outreach and the small group that I was in, of course, was the opera outreach group. So we would do um, these, uh, these operas that were, um, the one that I remember the most was, it, it took pieces of established operas, you know, traditional mm -hmm. operas, and then put them into a story. Um, mm -hmm. And we sang it in, we sang all of it in the original languages. So some of it was in Italian, some of it was in French, some of it was in German. Uh, so it was really cool for, for the kids to be able to see all those different languages and hear all those yeah. different languages. But um, but we would go into the, to elementary schools and, and perform for these kids. And sometimes, you know, sometimes um, the kids would just go wild for it. Like it was like, it was like the first time they had ever heard people singing like this. Yes, it was such absolutely. a wonderful yeah. experience right, uh, for right. me and my colleagues. Um, and especially to hear that coming out of the military, I thought was also uh, pretty profound because, you know, we, we all know that the military is not necessarily a very, um, open and uh, artistic uh, place. So <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so I, I really had a wonderful time when I was in, uh, but specifically because we did major choral works and then we also were, uh, I was a part of that uh, opera outreach mm -hmm. program. That, yeah. what, what you said earlier about taking, uh, you know, pieces of all of these operas and threading them together to create a story. I, I learned that at the Metropolitan Opera as a part of the education and outreach programs, there are the operas for everyone program mm -hmm. um when we said when we sang an aria uh, clearly the aria from bohem is about that bohemian story mm -hmm. and your segedia is about the story in carmen but the director wanted us to create our own story using that aria whether it's in italian french german english russian or whatever that it did not have to be specific to the story of the piece to bring it closer to the people, you know, a story that they understood more rather than making it this esoteric thing about, you know, this girl dying and this is happening and this is happening. Create your own story about that work. And I found out that um, for me doing that, that actually helped me in development of the character of the actual piece, really. Mm -hmm. That for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. And on the on the subject of languages, I know that you have done some traveling to Europe and done some singing in Europe. Do you also speak other languages? I, I speak German because I studied uh, German for a very long time before I went to Europe. Mm. I actually went to Europe on my first contract there. I was actually hired here in the States to sing in Munich at the Biennale Festival. And from that gig, I actually auditioned while in Europe and I got hired in Munich and in Austria uh, and Finland and other places in Europe. So yes, I speak German, um, uh, French, um, it's hard, it's really hard. Um, and Italian, not really well, but I understand it very well. Um, do you speak any of the languages? Uh, yes, I actually, I studied French my whole life. And then oh. um, in college, I, I did a semester abroad and lived in Paris. And oh. of course, before I went to Paris, I thought I was pretty good at French. And then when I got there, I realized oh, how yeah. terrible I was. <laughs> um, but then um, I had this wonderful moment where I was, uh, I'll never forget, I'll never forget. It was about three quarters of the way through my semester. I was sitting, talking with my French mom, my host mom. And I realized that I wasn't translating anymore, that I was just having yes, a conversation. Speaking. It Literally. was, it was, it, it gave me goosebumps. It still gives me goosebumps every time I think about it. So yeah. that was fun. But I, but I, I studied German, of course, and I studied Italian as well. Um, I, I can read them, but I don't really, I don't know them and I can't speak them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Dana and I actually, yes, Karen. <laughs> I was wondering if, you both could sing another song, or at least I know. Well, and I wanted to say one more thing. Um, one of our qu early choir members who now is in Chicago, Sunita Sharat, had a program here called Opera in the Hood. And this was maybe 25 years ago. Or 
we have a recording of it and she and her son she would sing an aria and he would do uh, some spoken word or rap mm. or hip around it and and then at our a big concert we did at the landmark theater with pete seeger she did i don't know what the aria was it was beautiful we sang it with her and the, another young man did a Martin Luther King speech, I Have a Dream, along with oh, it. Wow. And it was phenomenal in the way that you were speaking of, Gregory, of moving the music into us in a mm -hmm. different way and connecting it to um, a very powerful message. So wow. um, I, I have familiar. that recording. I, I will send it on to you sometime because it was great. That sounds anyway, familiar. I know you Operate. have a song, Dana. Dana, would you like to sing Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, the next song I'm going to sing is actually not from an opera. It is musical theater. So I'm going to be showing you my my other technique. Um, I'm going to be playing the piano this time relatively <laughs> poorly. Um, <laughs> all right. Can you still hear me? Yes. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So this is uh, She Used to Be Mine by Sarah Bareilles. From the, from the musical Waitress. Can you hear that? Yes? Okay, great. All right. It's not simple to say Most days I don't recognize me With these shoes apron that place and its patrons have taken more than I gave them not easy to know I'm not anything like I used to be although it's true I was never attention sweet center I still remember
that's an example of like having a great technique to be able to go from that full belt to singing that very high fluty pianissimo and still have the core of your voice there. It's beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. You're welcome. So should I sing? Yeah. Yeah. yeah what, what, all right. So I'm not, I, well, I'm sorry. What do you have for us? Oh, I'm going to sing a song called the lone wild bird. I'm not going to accompany myself. Um, it's a, a simple tune and uh, I've known it since I was in college. When I was an undergraduate, I was soloist at First Unitarian up on uh, Notting Nottingham and Warring Road up there across from Drumlins. Uh, and uh, I, I learned it to sing at that congregation. And so from my research of what I remember when I was a kid that, um, it's a, a hymn tune, a hymn, hymn tune. The tune is from the Dakota natives, is what I was told. So very good example of excellent technique to be able to do that a cappella and stay in tune. <laughs> yes, yep. thank God. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to tell um, our friends here something that they may not know about each of us. Um, Danan and I are co-directors of a festival in the Adirondack Mountains. It's called the Long Lake Friends of Music series. And I only know about this because of Danan, who sang a recital there, I think, in 2017 summer? I believe so. Um, and I think you should tell him how you got the job, and then I'll finish how I got the job. So, um, so I was uh, at this beautiful overlook in the town where we, where we have a, a tiny little cabin, and uh, I was wearing a Syracuse Opera t-shirt, 
I was there with my children. We go there to do cartwheels and um, the, the grass is full of all of this wild thyme. It just, it smells so wonderful and you can see all the high peaks off in the distance on a clear day. So we were there just hanging out and this man was also there uh, walking his dogs and he approached me and he said, uh, excuse me, uh, how are you affiliated with Syracuse Opera? Like, why are you wearing this t-shirt? Nobody around here knows about opera. It's, it's this teeny tiny little town called Newcomb, just south of the High Peaks. Um, so we started talking and it turned out that he ran the Long Lake Friends of Music recital series. And he asked me um, if, if I would be you know interested in singing on it. So um, we corresponded via email, of course, and that's how I got involved. And so I, I did the, the recital that year. And then they asked me, um, uh, if I knew any other people who who might want to come up and sing and I said well you should contact my friend Gregory so <laughs> so they contacted him and Gregory was on the bill for the next year and then he like what was it during the concert they announced the, that you were taking over yes <laughs> the during the concert I I had no idea this was happening but I but right before I began the performance they announced that our our, our artist this evening Gregory Shepherd will become the new artistic director of the Long Lake Friends of Music series. I'm like, what? <laughs> How did that happen? Well, anyway, th so that happened. And then the next summer, it was a pandemic and we couldn't present. And then this past summer, we also were advised not to present because of the pandemic. And so during this, this off period, this summer, I thought, you know, I really want to do this. I really want to do it. And I've got the artistic skill and end to do all of this but I need someone else who could be the managing director. And so without talking to the Long Lake people, I called Dana and I said, Dana, you know, I'm gonna run this festival, but I want you to be the managing director. Will you do this? And she said, yeah, I'll do it. So we are partners in crime with the Long Lake Friends of Music Summer Festival. It runs from uh, the first weekend uh, in July, Thursday night concerts, through the first week of August. Well, we have six programs, uh, concerts program. We may only do five because I understand we can get away with doing five and still keep our grants. So we may do five programs, but um, uh, Dana and I are doing this thing together. Um, and it's it's been uh, fun. I mean, we've talked a little bit about it, but the programming is all set and she's got the uh, all of the administrative and financial skills and all of that part that we need and I'm going to do, you know, the, the, the artistic end and reaching out and programming. And I think it's going to be a, a really good time. And if any of you want to come up to a uh, long Lake next summer, concerts are free. They're on Thursday evenings. Come and join us in uh, a, a, a really small, beautiful, little intimate Methodist church that seats about 125 people. Um, no air conditioning, it's hot, all the windows are open, all the doors are open, but it is music for the people. It That's is great. community coming together and making all uh, great, great music. So that's one of the things Danny and I do. And uh, I'm an artist manager. And so two years ago, I said, Danny, can I manage you? So Danny and I work together as uh, a, a artist and agent as well. Yep. So we have a lot of connections. Yeah, we do have a lot of connections. It's been wonderful. Um, uh, yeah, so do, should we, is now about the time that we should start taking questions maybe? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Questions and comments. Yeah. Does anybody have questions or comments for Gregory or I? I or can't Dana. see everyone. Um, Any comments for Dana or questions for Dana? <laughs> <laughs> Jack. I, I only want to say one thing that I was waiting to say to Greg. Uh oh. When you feel sad or under a curse. Oh my goodness. Your life your is life bad. Is bad. Your prospects are worse. are worse. I have never <laughs> forgotten that. I, I'm probably the only person here who was in the audience. You were about 16 years old. Yes. Was it at, was at Henniger? I have yes. never, it so impressed me. Oh. God. It just it it blew me away. Uh, he, there was a talent show, and he did that number from Gaza, dressed in a three-piece white suit. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to say your name, Joanne. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Joanne Bakeman. 
Jo uh, uh, yeah, my name that? at that time, my last name was Cacioli at that time. And uh, I went to the uh, student shows at Henniger because my husband taught there. I was from the south side of Syracuse also. So I knew that about you. And when you came out on that stage and started singing that, when you feel sad. <laughs> It absolutely blew me away. It blew that away is, everyone in the audience. You had a standing ovation that just went on and on and yes. on and on. You were about That's, 16. Yeah, I was I was actually 17. I had just turned 17. 17. Yeah. And it was it was the, the spring musical, and we did three big excerpts from three shows: Godspell, Romeo and Juliet, and The Wiz, which were all big shows back then. Um, I and and I was the lead in the Godspell. You were there. I was there. I've That's never forgotten wild. it. It's, That's it's wild. So impressed me. It just. Oh, well, thank you. It was thank it was you. wonderful. Well, that, that 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 actually leads me a little bit back to what Dana asked earlier about how did my friends and all feel about me? Yeah. You know, sing, because that actually yeah. was the very first year. I was in the music program because I actually was embarrassed as a kid, you know, to like be like a singer singing mm -hmm. and doing choir and in shows and all of that kind of stuff. So none of my friends at school knew that I played piano or that I that I sang at all, you know, because I just I just wanted to be like on the track team and do all mm -hmm. of the sports things and not let anybody know that I was involved in music. But it was Mrs. Gaucher that yeah. year at Henninger who yeah. knew me from Could church, you? who said, you must come and be in the music program. Yeah. And when I got in the program, actually, I, I, I didn't even care anymore about what anybody yeah. thought. But yeah. before that, I did. I was never involved in music in high school because I was embarrassed. Mary was wonderful. She had that way with students yeah. that was just un unforgettable. But- yeah. um, Mary's still alive. She, she, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think she came to our sing out two weeks ago. Oh, cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, Mary Gaucher. She. Mary Gaucher. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I know her. Yeah. Oh, okay. Joanne Cacioli. That was my name. Yeah, it's Joanne yeah. Bakeman. Uh, but you, you had everyone eating out of your hand. <laughs> he <laughs> always so does. He always was, does. It was never a question that you oh, were going to okay. be. Oh yeah, the music Thank you. talent. Yeah. Thank was, you. Uh, oh, my I, gosh, I, I can't believe it. Whenever I, I hear your, whenever I hear your name or I see a, uh, advertising for anything to, that you're going to do, I always skip around here singing that song. When <laughs> you feel sad <laughs> or unproductive, you, oh. when you get to heaven, you'll be blessed. Yes, <laughs> it's all for the best. The best. That's right. Oh my goodness. Sorry. Oh, that's well. You made my evening. Thank you. Oh, good. Anyway. good, we, we, good. we don't have a lot more time, so maybe we could have two more comments or questions. Yeah. Christian. What, yeah. Gregory? Where are you living now, full time? Oh, I live in New York City, full time. But um, <clears throat> back in March uh, of this year, I actually bought. Um, my mother's house here in Syracuse over on Crawford Avenue. Um, I, because I'm, I'm in town, I come into town probably once a month because I'm on the board and the management staff of Syracuse Opera now. Um, and I wanted to buy a house and I thought, why shouldn't I buy my mother's house? So, so I live in New York City full time up on the Upper West Side near, uh, near the Met. And uh, I come into Syracuse all the time. I was in your neighborhood today, Karen. You were? I had Dominican food right around the corner on Westcott Street. That's right. Oh, you went there. I went yeah. there. <laughs> Other comments, I a, thoughts? I have a question. Yes, Carolyn. Um, I actually posted it in the chat. I'm oh. interested how we, the people, the everyday people, not the opera singers, can uh -oh. avoid straining our voices. Um, in my case, it's trying to sing through a mask and lead people. Um, totally did my voice in a few weeks ago. So I'm trying to learn to listen better to my body. And I don't have years and years of training in opera because if I did, it wouldn't matter. I could just blast the mask off. 
but I think other people have that issue as well. I don't think it's just me. Dana? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you for asking that, Carolyn. So um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I, I'm glad you're talking about, you know, listening to your body because that's, that's kind of the main thing um, is the, the sensations in the body being very aware of the sensations in the body and also, um, you know, what's happening in the core in order to um, to get the voice out because if, if there's strain here then the voice is not going to last but if the energy is mostly focused in here and in kind of the the midsection of the body then the voice is freer so um, of course it has to do with very good breathing being very connected to your body you know honestly when i sing i like to think a lot about the fact that karen likes to tell me that i'm a tree um, and so I try to, I try to breathe and sing into the trunk of my tree and really even kind of into my thighs and then let the voice be my branches and, and the wind whisking through the branches. So I, I try to take a very light approach to singing. You know, I, I, I have not sang through a mask. Um, I, I can't imagine what that's like. It must be strange. Um, <clears throat> But it's I think singing through mic, you have to be really aware of what your jaw is doing. I find even when I'm wearing a mask and I'm not singing that my I, I have a lot of tension in my jaw. So just being aware of that and maybe like rocking it back and forth a couple of times uh, like this when you're singing. Um, <clears throat> and when you start feeling vocal fatigue, see if somebody else can take over. Because that's, you know, just resting the voice is the best thing that you can do for it if you are feeling strained or if you're starting to, to sound hoarse or feel hoarse. Yeah, Gregory, anything else to add? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. And I, I really like the thing that you said about, you know, the focus on the middle of the body there, the, the support. That's really important. And really listening to your body because it, it, it is much smarter than we are. It sustains <laughs> us and does everything it needs to do without us doing anything to assist it. And if you really approach it in a really natural and organic way, always, I, I think I haven't sung through the mask either, but if you if you decide understand what the purity of the vowel is and just sing pure vowels and really sing, as she said, think about a light projection, really singing easy on the voice, supporting, being connected to the middle of your body, but not feeling like well, a lot of things I think that we do when we when we sing is that we all of a sudden become a singer. There's this thing that we have to do as a singer. But if you th don't think about that and think about the natural thing that actually organically happens is that you take a breath and out of that sound flows and think about pure vowels and just ease of production. I think it'll help singing through the mask. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think tr like trying to project or like trying to be loud is the it's exact like, opposite of what opposite. you should be doing. Yes. Yeah. Just try to allow the sound to happen. And honestly, that it, it is it is louder and more present when it's more relaxed. When it's and more when relaxed. Not trying and, and, to muscle and, and out and the volume. And you feel like it's less. Yes, right. But it's a little yeah. counterintuitive. Yeah. I thank you I, for I, that. And I think oh. you touched on it really early as I was stressed about doing it. I'm used to okay. leading kids, like mm -hmm. more than 100 kids at a time. But being around 20 adults, you know, I'm, I'm much more self-conscious and uh, yeah, I, I hope that's helpful to others because I don't think I'm the only one. <laughs> yeah. Well, Carolyn, but you're very awesome. Helpful me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, this is, this is Marsha. I just wanted to say, if you're singing through a mask, all the stuff that Gregory and uh, Dana, those are all really good tips, but what it is, is the fibers in the mask. Every time that you inhale and exhale, you get the fibers from the mask in your throat. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get hoarse if you continue to sing through the mask. You have mm -hmm. to keep your voice, your, your mouth and throat lubricated the entire time. You can't take whatever it is you have, either a peppermint or I don't suggest menthol, but a peppermint, anything to coat the throat mm -hmm. because of the fibers. But that's mm -hmm. mostly what causes the um the adverse re uh, reaction so that you become hoarse a lot faster mm -hmm. no that matter how co you know conscious you are it's it's the mask yeah that was all yeah okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Anybody else? Thanks, Marsha. Good point. Um, I can't see the whole everybody, so just jump in if you want to. We're what we'll what we're going to do is have some choir announcements, the community announcements, and then we'll do appreciations. Um, but we have time for one more question or thought. Can we get back to our? Thanks, Dana. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Marcia. Thanks, Gregory. All. You're you're in Ballad of the Brown King as well, aren't you? No, no. You're not it's in it. For, no, it's tenor, soprano, and mezzo. Okay. Yeah. So why don't just, we just do our announcements and then then we'll um, do some clear more thank yous and appreciations for the two of you, if that's okay with you. Um, are there any community announcements first? You know how we love our announcements, Dana. <laughs> Is there anyone who knows the details on our sing out tomorrow? Speaking of singing through a mask. <laughs> the details are on the, the Wednesday um, mailing. Right. I know that. I just thought it might be good to say it out loud. Yeah. Well, this Karen, is Allison. I'll put them in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other community announcements? Hello, Joan. I didn't see you. Um, how about choir announcements? This is Allison, she, her pronouns. Um, well, first of all, thank you too for being here. Uh, I learned a lot about opera and I, I knew very little and now I know a little bit more, <laughs> but it was lovely to listen to you. Um, we'd love for um, everyone to consider making a donation as generously as you can. I put the um, links for that in the chat. Um, next week, we'll be doing music for movements. So come, Ideally, with a song in mind um, that you that you appreciate as uh, activist music, um, and we'll we'll chat with each other, and then we'll work on our song "Honor the Dark," um, and that that teach in will be next Saturday from twelve to one. So I put the link for that as well as to the Google Drive so that you can learn your part. Um, and next Sunday, November seventh, we Karen, do you want to talk about our puppets? day uh, yeah we're we are filming a processional in the park to be used with our virtual winter solstice concert so and we're filming three times in the park one when it was green one when it's fall and one when it's winter so the next one is on november 7th it's a sunday at three and um if you i know that christian's going to be there with the sun but if you would like to be a be part of it, um, please let Allison or I know. We're organizing puppeteers, and some of the children will be there also. And uh, it'll be fun. You don't even have to be. You can just come, Dana, with your family and do a puppet and be a part of the, <laughs> the processional if you would like to. Um, that's next Sunday. So, or the 7th. The 6th is the, the practice with... Um, Leah Morris and Sunday is the puppets. Um, I guess that's, is that it, Allison? Um, yeah, folks can contact me if you wanna be involved with puppets. I put my email into the chat too. It's amullenstout at gmail.com. And in two weeks, we'll have a concert with Reggie Harris. So save the date, it'll be the same time and Zoom link. So we're very excited to to have him come and sing some songs for us. We'll, we'll also be streaming that to Facebook. That's all I can think of. So it's time for appreciations. Oh, Karen, did, did you wanna say anything about quilt? Oh, I did mention it in the beginning. We, we, are, we do have a quilt made by Ada Jacques, Frida's mom. 
which is going to be really a great thing to raffle off for the Winter Solstice concert. It's a star, a big star. Um, so people who volunteered to make squares, you won't have to do that, but we will be asking people to, um, to help us get the word out and sell raffle tickets. And um, hopefully we will um, honor Ada by making a lot of money, <laughs> which is not that important, but sort of important. <laughs> <laughs> All right, appreciations. I, I don't know uh, exactly why, but when both of you sang your songs at the end, I was tearing, tearing through the, both of them. So I think that there was a space that you created that was um, really loving and warm with each other and with us. And then to hear you, your, your, your voices, your body, your soul, I guess I would say was really moving to me. So thank you. You're welcome. Colin, you're unmuted. Can I speak? Yes, yeah. Colin. Oh, yeah. Um, this is Christian. Um, I just want, I'm like, I'm glad to see certain people I haven't seen in a while, like Karen Gillette. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it's just nice seeing everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to see people tomorrow, depending if I can get there. Uh, I have an appreciation, if that's okay. This is Danan, she, her. Um, I would like to appreciate Karen for inviting us here today and also to um, Colleen for calling me and helping me with the, the settings for how to use Zoom and not sound like absolute garbage. And um, and also the the young person that helped us with the sound check earlier tonight. What, what was her name again? Their name is Diawin. Diawin, uh, yes. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And I have an appreciation. I'd like to thank Marsha for inspiring me when I was seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, and so on. Thank you, Marsha. And I'd like to thank Jack Mano, who has become a great friend because of the Society for New Music and the works that uh, they have presented for the people on the life of Libba Cotton and also Matilda Gage. That's when I first met Jack in Canovia uh, three summers ago. Thanks, Jack. He's not there. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Jack. <laughs> Other, anybody else? Joan. I would like to thank Dana and Gregory for sharing of yourselves so freely and sharing your techniques. And I want to thank everybody behind the scenes who every week puts this all together. Sister Zoe, Jen, everyone, thanks. This is Diane. I want to also thank Gregory and Danan and, and the web of people, Marsha especially, but so many people. Joanne, um, Mary Gaucher, who I saw at the Sing Out a couple of weeks ago. Oh. And it's just, we're such an amazing web here in Syracuse and, and way beyond. And so I thank you for bringing that out in music mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. This is Carolyn again. I just wanna thank uh, Dana and Gregory for your answer and Marsha, the insight about what, what masks can do to singing and, and just the whole choir leadership for creating these amazing opportunities. And, you know, I didn't used to like classical music at all cause I didn't understand it. 
So I've challenged myself. I haven't, you know, opera has not been my thing, but I've challenged myself to come be open because we can all keep learning and singing till the day we die. So. Steve. This is Steve. Um, I appreciate, I, I appreciate the, uh, the way that you interacted with each other and the questions you asked, because that's the kind of uh, behind the scenes conversation that we don't generally get to experience. And uh, Dana, and I just want to thank you for still for leading us to a uh, uh, the, pulling us by the teeth and nail to sing the hymn of, Ax of Axion <laughs> many years ago, uh, which was so complex, but it was so great to be able to sing that. So thank you. Yeah, uh, that's one of my the experience of singing that song with the Syracuse Community Choir is one of my very top musical lifetime, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that will stick with me for my entire life. I absolutely loved doing that with all of you. Thank you. Well, Steve, it was you that brought it. That's true. I actually <laughs> forgot that at the moment. Where well, are I have we one. Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Okay, I just have one last one. This is this is Dana and she her. I would just like to thank Gregory um, for um, being so kind to me and really to everyone that you meet um, because you are a superstar and um, it, it can sometimes be intimidating being around such a talent, but you are so gracious and wonderful and uh, and so so generous. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Right back at you, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. I guess we're just about done unless anyone's got any more thoughts. It's right on time. So um, we'll hope to see everybody next week and um, keep on singing, I guess. Okay. Okay. Keep on singing. Keep on. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks Thank for opera for the people. Thank you. Night. Hey.